go up. And you know how it is with medical doctors. Sometimes stuff comes up. All right, so we got that. And uh, so watch for him to come in shortly. May I introduce myself? My name is Lou Augusta. My claim to fame is that I'm the author of three books on empathy, high-end scholarly academic publications, including two books entitled A Rumor of Empathy with different subtitles. Uh, so uh, that's what got me. That's the reason why I'm speaking to you today. I have a PhD from the philosophy department of the University of Chicago many years ago. I wrote a dissertation on empathy in the philosophy department. That's kind of different, if I may say so. And it worked well for me. I have training as a psychotherapist. And today, we're going to engage the matter of what is empathy and why it is important. The talk is going to correspond to the announcement and blurb that we published earlier. You may or may not have seen it. Uh, we're going to talk concisely about a short history of the secret underground history of empathy. There is one. It's going to be concise, and I think it will be engaging to you. We're then going to look at some issues around the difference between empathy and compassion, the matter of compassion fatigue, professional burnout, how empathy plays in that manner. And then I'm going to tell some stories. Basically, I'm going to tell some stories. And I'm going to draw on great, it's not that I don't have clinical material, and today I'm going to tell some stories. And you'll be, I think, engaged and interested and surprised to hear how clinically relevant the stories are. I'm going to rely on such storytellers as Thomas Mann, uh, Tennessee Williams, uh, the author of Cyrano de Bergerac, Edmund Rostand, now a major motion picture. These are actually all major motion pictures at some point. If you don't want to know 600 pages of Thomas Mann, uh, there is a story in the universe. So, uh, having said that, uh, we are, the challenge, we are going to create a context for a conversation about empathy. The challenge is always in any encounter. What's the context? How did we get here? The word itself, empathy, in the English language, was invented around 1895. It, there wasn't even a word empathy in English until the late 19th century. So a man named Edward Bath Bradford Titchener, a Cornell University psychologist, went to Europe, as did so many of the uh, innovators at that time, along with William James and Burroughs, the anthropologist, and all of those guys. Anyway, went and studied with Wilhelm Wundt. We pause for a moment. One of the founders of psychology. Thank you for, thank you for the laugh there. Uh, and was translating some of Wundt's work. Some of Wundt's work. Uh, work. And the German word Einfühlung, which actually gets mentioned in the 18th century, Herder and some of the romantic colleagues. Anyway, he chooses the word empathy. And the, in some sense, the rest is history. Now, flashback. Now we flashback. David Hume, the British philosopher David Hume, 1739, A Treatise of Human Nature has five different meanings of the word sympathy. Hundreds, if not thousands, of references to sympathy in the English language, in the Greek language, and all, in the Western canon. It's everywhere. Here's what I say. Close enough. Close. Let's see what we can learn from that. So, Hume was never a stickler for consistency. Never a stick, you know, never a stickler for consistency, Hume. So, one meaning is emotionally contagious. When I walk into a party with a bunch of happy people, I get happy. When I spend some time with somebody who's down in the dumps, having a really hard time, guess what? I get less happy. I get melancholy. I get upset. That's the first meaning. Second meaning, suggestibility. Suggestibility. Jerome Frank, MD, PhD writes a whole book on persuasion and psychotherapy and rewrites it with, I believe, his daughter, Julie. Interesting, interesting as a mechanism, right? There's some controversy about the mechanism there. Nevertheless, when a, a, a friend, an acquaintance, a colleague,
colleague makes a suggestion to me, I am sympathetically disposed to that. Even if I don't agree, even if I'm not completely carried away, I'm sympathetic. Second meaning. Third meaning, a technical meaning in the philosophy of Hume. In sympathy, I have an impression of your impression. I have an experience of your experience. That starts to sound like the modern meaning of vicarious introspection. That starts to sound like a vicarious experience of another person's experience without use value, without moral judgments. So that's his definition, uh, a definition of sympathy. I have, in effect, a representation of your representation. As I said, an experience of your experience. So bingo, the light goes on at that moment. Here we have something like, in our listening, and we will rigorously define empathy uh, momentarily. Uh, and I also am going to uh, have some visuals here, right? Uh, there's David Hume in the upper left. Uh, fourth meaning, he actually migrates the definition of sympathy in the direction of benevolence. He's a philosopher, he's writing a theory of knowledge, a theory of foundation of morality. He ends up, between 1739 and 1751, the word sympathy gets transformed into something like benevolence. Taking action to help those who may arguably require some action. And then the fifth meaning is a delicacy of sympathy. Hume writes about a delicacy of sympathy and a delicacy of taste. A delicacy of sympathy is involved when I'm a particularly sensitive friend, associate, colleague. I attend to fine-grained aspects of the person I'm relating to. I would say, think of a mental status report in a sense. You look at are the buttons lined up, or those little details that don't necessarily mean anything in and of themselves, and yet can be deeply meaningful and significant. So he writes of a delicacy of sympathy and a delicacy of taste, and then migrates all of the good aspects of sympathy in the direction of aesthetic taste, and keeps for sympathy irascibility. That a person has a certain uh, orneriness, if you will, or grouchiness. It, it, it has some common possibilities. So, Sympathy gets migrated in the direction of theory of art and beauty. This will be significant for the secret underground history of empathy. Okay, so five different meanings of sympathy in David Hume. And now we're going to say two things about each of these three other guys and then dive into an engagement. So Immanuel Kant, philosopher, 1787, 1790, his I would say a reconstruction of the relevance of empathy in the philosophy of Kant occurs in his theory of aesthetics, in his theory of art and beauty. What's going on here, ladies and gentlemen, you may ask. Basically, he says, in the experience of beauty, I have an experience, the observer, the person engaged, right, has an experience of the communicability of feeling. He writes about the communicability of affect as being one of the essential aspects of the appreciation of beauty. This is phase one of empathy. If you stop there, it's going to be incomplete. It's going to be something like emotional contagion. It's going to be something like a suggestibility. But it, it shows that there's something going on there that is deeply significant. He then, Kant then says, put yourself in the person. In, put yourself in the position of the other person. That's top down. That's the folk psychology definition of empathy, right? We work both top down, we'll take a walk in the other person's moccasins, in effect. Take a walk in the other person's shoes. So he's got both bottom up and top down empathy. Things really get going with somebody, Theodore Lips, as you watch at looking at the screen there, bottom one, Theodore Lips, uh, roughly a contemporary of Freud. He dies in 1914, game over. It's a big day, of course. And Here's the interesting thing about Theodore Lips. There were seven volumes of his work in the Freud Library, and he read them. Freud did. They're mar margins. The thing about Lips is that he was, in effect, the Antonio Salieri.
to Freud's Mozart. <coughs> Remember the movie Amadeus, right? Mozart is toiling away in obscurity. Nobody ever, I mean, of course, today, he's playing all the major symphony orchestras. And except for the movie itself, nobody has ever heard of Sol Solgari Antonio, right? I mean, okay, so that's the point here, right? That Lips, in his day, owned the word. He owned the word empathy. I'm familiar with German. Nobody could touch that word without evoking a sense of being a student of Lips. So along comes Freud, whose methods are, I suggest, deeply empathic. We've got quotations to prove that. And he can't use the word without evoking a measure of being, in effect, a follower and student. And Freud, of course, is his own man. He doesn't cotton to anybody else. And so Lips has, Lips says that most, in fact, he says that all psychological functions and processes are basically unconscious. There's a celebrated quotation in Freud's uh, 18, uh, I want to say, 1891 correspondence with his friend uh, Wilhelm Fleece that he has found, Freud says, I found my ideas in Lips, and that's disturbing to me. What the, the reader finds more than he might wish in that regard. <coughs> and, uh, and so in 24 volumes of Freud's work, there are 22 mentions of empathy, kind of them. And Harry Trostman, I didn't actually personally count it all, but uh, Dr. Trostman did so in his little article on the Freud Library. And of those, all of the clinical references are mistranslated. Alex Strachey and James Strachey, the, uh, the translators, make up other words. If you look at their correspondence, they have devaluing remarks about the word empathy. Uh, Alex, that, that's the wife in this case, uh, and, and James agrees with her completely. Uh, it's an elephantine word. Where did this thing come from? They, they paraphrase, they talk about understanding. They do talk about sympathy, which, as we know, has a long tradition. Nevertheless, the empathy moment gets buried. And Freud, in himself, I want to say, in the 1913 beginning treatment says, this is a great quote, the physician, I'm going to paraphrase, and then I'll paraphrase it even more closely, the physician is going to run into trouble in the treatment unless the physician begins with empathy. That's it. That's the content. So, and then there, and so, although, arguably, although method, uh, Freud's methods are deeply empathic, the word itself is not usable because it's owned by Lips's projective theory of empathy. And the phenomenologists, I'm wrapping up the history now, Edith Stein, Edmund Husserl, Mark Shaler, and Martin Heidegger, you will have heard of a couple of those in any case, uh, attack and really debunk Lips's theory of projective empathy, at which point we're able to fast forward to quasi-modern times in the 1950s and the 1960s, where separately, Carl Rogers is innovating around unconditional positive regard. Heinz Kohut is innovating around vicarious introspection, narcissistic rage when people don't get the empathy to which they feel entitled, to which in many instances they are entitled. People get angry. They get enraged. And there's a whole narrative around that. And we don't believe that Rogers read uh, Kohut or vice versa. Rogers was reading uh, Paul Tillich, the existential humanist, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, the theologian. He was, uh, Kohut was reading Balint, one of the students of Ferenczi. Remember while we had Ferenczi, anyway, we can't go there right now. Uh, kind of a, a, a mix, mixed brand there. And so um, that's the short history, the underground history of empathy. Which brings us up now to this moment. And uh, I did some survey research. And I'm going to tell you about that. I had a class, 15 students. Here's an assignment. 
Ask five people what they think empathy is. Don't tell them. Like you know, but don't tell them anyway. Don't suggest a definition. Not members of your family, people you know, but you're not too close, you're not sort of middle level. So this is not double blind anything, ladies and gentlemen. This is the quality. But it's, it, there's a trend. So, you know, about 80 or 100 data points. The trend is most people will tell a story about compassion, about altruism, about being charitable, about helping. Most people, the person on the street, this is not good, not bad, it's what's so. According to this data, the person on the street thinks that empathy is compassion. And heavens knows the world needs more compassion. It is not empathy. So let's move along. Uh, here, so two thoughts at this point, right? That is going to be an issue going forward. And we may want to build both. We may want to, I mean, on any given day, we may want to have one or the other. And this is also anecdotal. I suggest to you that, this in my own thinking, and I struggle with this, I've gone deeply about a struggle with this, I'm not looking for more empathy. I'm looking for expanded empathy. This is a subtle, and I think, significant semantic difference. You know how we can feed everybody on the planet, like food-wise, nutrition-wise. We have enough food, green revolution, everything, everything. And people are starving in Aleppo. People are starving because of war and politics and human badness and misdistribution. People are starving in America, too. Their politics and misdistribution are really badly nourished. Uh, and, and it's, I suggest, this is just a pure analogy, I suggest a similar thing in the case of empathy. That if I say, we need more empathy, it sounds like, you don't have it. And how do you think that's going to go? Not perhaps, I may, there may, you know, on any given day, one may be in the zone or not in the zone. Right? So this is the realm of tips and techniques which I know people and are interested in and are engaged in. And, and so rather the, the project, the intention is to expand empathy, to get in touch with the empathy that's already available or not, and develop it further. And so that's, that's the thought there. Rather expanded empathy. And, uh, and so, with that in mind, so regarding compassion, regarding the distinction between, and this is, this is a big debate, right? Gregory Batson has done a lot of work and published uh, interesting articles on how empathy is fundamentally pro-social. If you're empathic, you're well disposed to do, to do something useful and build community and, and even altruism, charity, and, and the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And over here, on the other, we'll say, the stage left, if you will, we have Simon Baron Cohen, zero degrees of empathy, that there are outliers. We have a normal distribution, and most of us are kind of in the middle. We got some, but you know, on a good day we get there, and on a less good day we struggle like everybody else. But there are outliers. There are people who really don't get it or don't have some of what qualifies. And so we have the disorders of empathy around the Asperger scale, autistic spectrum, uh, around psychopathy, sociopathy, and, but that doesn't answer the debate as to how one develops what is there, right? Uh, or it doesn't answer the question, and then Kohat, meanwhile, is writing about the misuses of empathy, and his celebrated, uh, celebrated passages, well, maybe the, and he wasn't escaping, he didn't, uh, before World War II got going, he had literally to flee Vienna for his life from the Nazis. Uh, it, it would not have gone well had he stayed there like with so many other people, of course. And he says, well, you know, the bad guys, in effect, the Nazis attached sirens to the Stuka dive bombers, the better to terrify the people they were attacking. And they got inside their heads. And that was kind that he says, that was a very empathic moment, using it for bad purposes. And so the debate goes on and on. I, have, I, I now step into this debate. I'm bold, right? I now say, the way I gloss the matter, and ladies and gentlemen, this is not the truth with capital T. And consider the possibility that empathy tells me what the other person is experiencing. And compassion and 
pro-social attitudes, tell me what to do about it. Empathy tells me what's going on over there. And my good upbringing, my morals, my ethics, my training, that assumes a lot, right? I got some privileged and blessed, born in the USA. Those tell me what to do about it. So you can assume. So, and the, this is not going to solve the debate. I'm not sure what a test of this would even look like at the moment. But I find it compelling. And you can see how you can, different, reasonable people may disagree and take different sides, and the debate is joined. And it can go on precisely because we don't make that distinction in the right way or at the right time. And so now you've got a handout when you came in. Let's turn to it. If anybody didn't get a handout, you don't have to walk up to the front and get one here at the, uh, at the thing. And Phil will kindly help or not. Uh, uh, thank you. People will be, it's self serve. We have self serve. And that's good. Uh, so now that you, Lou, you're talking about empathy. What are you talking about? Best practice. Define our terms. Define our terms. And so I'm, here's the proposal. I'm going to take empathy and look at four aspects of empathy. I'm going to look at empathic receptivity, empathic understanding, empathic interpretation, and empathic responsiveness. Sometimes empathic responsiveness is used synonymously with empathic speech. And, and, and so, here we go, this is what you have in front of you. And I suggest that this definition is useful because each of these aspects of empathy breaks down in a characteristic way. And we can do some training around the breakdown. We can do some interventions around the breakdowns. We can, in effect, make some distinctions, capture some experiences, have some conversations, and make a difference when things go off the rails, as sometimes happens. So I'm going to say something about each. So here's the, these, this is an original synthesis of existing ideas. People have thought of this before. And I put some Lego blocks together, in effect. I take some credit here. And I would describe this definition of empathy as a original synthesis of existing ideas. You can see that there are traces of it already in David Hume, which we talked about, and I put all of them, and compassion is actually not on the list, although one might roll it up into phase four there. And in many ways, these exist simultaneously, and for purposes of training, conversation, engagement, trying to distinguish what the heck is going on, it may be useful to talk about them sequentially. I might even say four or five. And so, empathic receptivity, that's the openness moment. That I'm open to what your experience is. I have a vicarious experience of what you're experiencing. I'm in the movie of your life, right? And, and here's the filter, right? If I'm finding that I've over identified So if I, if you're suffering, you know, let's hope you're not, but let's say, did people have, different people have different ways of expressing their suffering. And if a person is suffering, you know, to them and relating to them and asking what's going on and they're telling me something and they're willing to share and communicate. If they're, I'm going to have, I'm going to have an experience of suffering. It's almost unavoidable. I'm going to have a vicarious experience of suffering. And if, in terms of empathy, if I'm overwhelmed, I'm doing it wrong. I should suffer, but strange as it may sound, just a little. I should have a trace effort, a sample. I, I suggest that you and I do in any case, if we're human beings. And that becomes, now if I stop that for any reason, I'm at risk of emotional contagion. I'm at risk of suggestibility. I'm going to process this vicarious experience as I would have in the, in the theater, right? It, it, there's a joke about that. People, this doesn't happen very often, but people who are not familiar with the conventions of the theater back in, you know, back in Taylor or Lipsis time, you would say a peasant from the countryside goes to the theater and the villain is about to do some mischief to the hero or heroine and the peasant jumps up on the stage to rescue the individual. That person didn't get it. Right? You're supposed to sit there and experience a certain 
vicarious offset and vicarious satisfaction when they, right, right, you know this, right? This is like, but nevertheless, you get the distinction between a vicarious experience and in effect a merger and identification. So, phase one, empathic receptivity. This is where vicarious, vicarious introspection plays large. I'm going to take that and process it further. Maybe instantaneously. The expert does this instantaneously. You and I may need to think about it. We may usefully do some, some, there may be some processing. The, the wheels may be turning. I may introspect at this point. That would be an introspection. And so, and what is empathic possibility? The, here I, I define possibility in terms of possible relationships. We're going to look, it'll be helpful to look at an example of this from literature. And what is the possibility for this relationship? Some, if somebody's suffering, there may be a breakdown. Breakdowns can notoriously become a source of breakthrough. Um, and so, I'm actually going to uh, put down And live in an understanding of one another based on who we are as human beings. And, and I pause for, for one moment because I want to make sure I cover the essential parts now as we move forward. Um, and we relate to one another, not in terms, so here's, here I got it now, thank you not in terms of use value, not necessarily in terms of theoretic knowledge, not in terms of selling or enrolling somebody, but in terms of what is possible being in the presence of another human being. So hold that thought, empathic understanding. I take that understanding and make explicit what's there in an interpretation. And interpretation is the point at which we get the folk psychology understanding of empathy. I take a walk in your shoes. So there's role reversal, displacement. And you can see here the possibilities for projection, for egocentrism. We'll have a story a little bit on, and I do want to keep track of the time here. We're doing just fine. Uh, um, and uh, where in Thomas Mann's Budenbrooks. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of the story, right? I mean, he's a successful businessman who has given up an artistic career to pay the bills and support his family. He sacrificed his artistic career, and he compensates for it by marrying one. He marries his wife, Gerda. Gerda. He's Nordic times. Uh, is a talented violinist, and she plays fantastic virtuoso duos with her father. Anyway, they have a son, Johan, Hanno for short, and Thomas's commitment is that Hanno's going to go into business. He's going to be a chip off the old wall. You can see the conflict coming, because he's an artistic type too. Everybody in the family has got artistic sensibility. So this is the setup. It's a setup for conflict and for misinterpretation. He's projecting, you're going to be just like your dad. It doesn't go very well. We'll talk more about that. Uh, and so we look at what, that's his commitment. That's his undeclared commitment. That's his possibility. And the results he gets are a perfect correlation with the commitment. And there's misunderstandings and struggle. And so uh, that understanding gets unpacked in the folk psychology take a walk. And this is like top-down empathy, right? So I get some experiences, my curious experience, process them top-down. You can do this. You can do this even in your chair. And we'll have a little exercise. And finally, empathic responsiveness. What is that? What are you talking about? I'm listening to the other person. I'm in a relationship with the other person. I'm getting some stuff from the other person. They're telling me some stuff. They're telling me a story. I give the other person back their experience, whatever it is that's been encapsulated in what they've told me. I give the other person back their experience in such a way that they recognize it as their own. 
that moment of recognition, that's the impact that the sponsor is. So we're going to have an example of that. Whatever. So you know, empathy can be a tree that falls in the forest without anybody being there. I can, on a good day, I can be perfectly empathic with your struggles and whatever is going good or whatever is going awful in your life. And I can sit there like the Zen master. You want to practice being a Zen master? Or not? And nobody knows me. It doesn't mean I'm not empathic. I got something. Something's going on. I'm doing something right. Keep doing it. And it may make it doesn't make it may or may not make a difference for the other person. Sometimes it's obvious we don't need words, but we are verbal. Uh, it, the, the, the handshake, the arm around the shoulder is can be deeply meaningful. The leaning into the conversation, all of these things. The body language is significant here. You know, we can insert the story about mirror neurons and and everything, and it's significant. There's a neurological substructure here which actually is not a part of this circle. There's another slide behind this slide, which is a bunch of neurology. We are neurons. We are neurons all the way around. And then the neurons start to generate meaning. That's where the slide comes in. Now, if I may say so, you're on my journey. Let's talk. And if the neurons don't work right, it's another and a very important conversation. So. That's the four moments of empathy. And when things, so when things go off the rail, you turn over the piece of paper, uh, and there's more stuff there. And so I, I've alluded to emotional contagion. I'm getting anxious. I'm extremely anxious here. It's not because I'm standing in front of this group who are friendly and gracious. I now, by the way, I acknowledge your empathy. You're listening. And I'm talking. And we are going to get through it so we can have QA. I'm going to even, may even pause for breath. But first, I could be, there's nobody here in the front row who's like really anxious. Or, but you know, maybe there could be. And then I'm picking up the anxiety. And I'm like, but what? I'm not asking where it comes from. So we have crowd behavior, Enthu the way enthusiasm sweeps through a group. It's not empathy, clearly not. It's input to the empathic process. When, remember the double representation in Hume, the experience of the experience? Hume gets some credit here because he, can, he speaks of, he calls out a reference to the other. He combines the vicarious experience with the reference to the other person, the other individual. So when I know, or at least if the light bulb goes on on a good day, maybe I'm picking this up from the other person. Then we advance. To what's possible. And of course, the breakdown in the case of empathic understanding is projection. Uh, we seem to have a design defect to do that. There may be adaptive value to that in the environment of evolutionary origin in terms of um, just considering the worst case scenario, you know. I mean, if if the if the tall grass waving in the breeze shows up like a tiger, right, that might eat me, or a big cat that might eat me. If I make that judgment, then I've wasted some time, and my friends will laugh at me for running away from the tall grass waving in the breeze. And that might not be good. I might have to have years of psychotherapy as a result of that experience. Nevertheless, all kidding aside, nothing really bad has happened. Whereas, if the tiger shows up as tall grass waving in the breeze, and I say that's tall grass waving in the breeze, and it's the tiger. Then you see the outcome is much more serious. I launch and gain more right down the So there may be a predisposition here, a design defect in terms of projection and a fundamental attribution error in, in terms of the negative. Uh, and so when so moving right along, uh, and we'll have, I have examples of each of these, so I'm going to leave enough time to get to it. The empathic interpretation. Uh, of course, is a misinterpretation. There are, are, are legions and many op opportunities for misinterpreting, for taking a statement and running with the ball in terms of what it might be. 
this is useful in the short term, but don't think it tells you anything about the other person. It may tell me something about myself. And finally, in terms of empathic responsiveness, uh, changing the subject is the ultimate unempathic response. You're suffering, and I change the subject. Well, there are many ways of changing the subject, right? The goal here is to give back the other person their experience in a way that they recognize it. And the nice thing about that is there's an opportunity for validation, confirmation. I haven't said a lot about science. This, a lot of this is out of the humanity. This is a scientific moment here. I get to check whether I'm going in the right direction. Did I get it? You can say, you know, I mean, you're going to say whatever you say, naturally. If you're walked in the door angry, you might not give me agreement. You might not give me that validation. And nevertheless, you might say something interesting that adds to the narrative that's emerging, right? And that might be counting against something, something useful to say. So if, so let's say on a good day, you acknowledge, you get it, Lou, yeah, that, boy, nobody grabbed it really, you know, I mean, I feel like I've been listened to, and I gotta tell you, that's a good experience, right? Well, on a less good day, uh, you know, that's incomplete. You might be getting warm, but you just don't get it. No, no, you just, so then iterate, you go back, and so it is a kind of hermeneutic circle, that's a, word of the day, theory of interpretation. So having said that, uh, now I propose to tell some stories. I started with the first story. So we're going to turn to literature. We're going to turn to literature. Thomas Mann, 1900. The year is 19. He writes Putin books. Story of a family. The rise and fall of the family of Putin books. And uh, same year as Freud publishes the interpretation of dreams, right? I mean, life in, in old Vienna and in Hanseatic Germany. So, as I mentioned, uh, <coughs> just coincidentally, Thomas Budenbrooks, a successful businessman, gave up his artistic career in order to run the family business, in order to pay the rent. And uh, so he compensates by marrying his artistic career. Uh, that joke. Uh, Gerda, she's playing passionate violin duos with her father, you know. She has to leave town. They re relocate. So now, she's no longer living with her father. Uh, and they have a son. We'll come back to that. They have a son, Hanu. He is somewhat sickly. In Thomas Mann, he is small. And artistic, of course. He has bad teeth. This is him. Uh, because he's going to go to the dentist. We're going to have a trip to the dentist. Yeah. Get ready. This is 1900, ladies and gentlemen. Get ready. Okay, I mean, so he's so he gets, you know, his father is a hail fellow, well met type. He's compensated. He's, Thomas has well compensated. He's no longer like, you know, a sensitive artist. He's like the cheerful, professional salesman. And he's something of a boot camp dad. Let's have your lessons, you know. Multiplication tables. But, you know, it's fairly standard in, in the gymnasium and in advanced prep schools. You know, let stand and deliver. I mean, it, build some character here, right? That's fine. You know, it's like nothing wrong with that. It doesn't work. It's not working very well with Hot. He just comes apart. It's like tears, you know, he breaks down, you can't do, he knows 12 times 12 is 144. He's like, <laughs> right, and he wants to go to his room and have his stories and fantasies. So, meanwhile, he has bad teeth, which we can talk about the symbolic value of that. It, it's a recurring motif in Ma, Thomas <coughs> Ma. It's perhaps, here's the psychoanalytic moment, perhaps suggesting that he doesn't really, sort of oral, passive aggressive, grasp the nibble of life and suck at it for all it's worth. He's really struggling with that. His teeth are kind of loose. They're bright, the enamel is good, but they're a lot of cats. So we're off to the, there's Herr Brecht in Mann. The dentist is named Herr Brecht, which means broke. It's like broken, broken tooth. Happens to be a famous playwright as well. So poor Han ends up at the dentist's office. Here is the first, the moment of empathic 
research in. So I'm going to quote. I'm going to quote. You're going to listen. I think I have this quote in the deck somewhere. But just just listen to. It. Get ready. Example of empathic receptivity. Page 403, 404. Budenbrooks translated by Love Love Porter. The bad thing about Dr. Brecht was he was nervous and dreaded the tortures he was obliged to inflict. We must proceed to extraction, he would say, growing pale. Hanno himself was in a pale cold sweat with staring eyes, incapable of protesting or running away. In short, in much the same condition as a condemned criminal, he saw Herr Brecht with the forcep, his sleeves bending over him, and noticed that little beads were standing out on Brecht's bald brow, and that his mouth was twisted. When it was all over, and Hanno, pale and trembling, spat blood into the blue basin at his side, Herr Brecht, too, had to sit down, wipe his forehead, and take a drink. This is not a quiz. What's going on here? Herr Brecht is suffering, right? I mean, he's suffering. Hanno's sweating. We don't go into the details, but dental work in those days was gruesome. Uh, and uh, he's like, the, the, so the joke, right? Bad joke. He should have gone into ophthalmology. I pause for my thing. Oh, no. he's, he's committed. So, so what he's experiencing emotional contagion. He's got emotional infection. Your description, the neurons are going off. His mouth is twisted, right? I mean, he's working in poor Hanos, getting in there. It's like, it's a mess. And his mouth is sweating, Hano's sweating, he's sweating. So this is the breakdown. This is a, it's a breakdown. And so what's the recommendation? Well, the record, in this instance, it's perhaps not as simple as one might wish. We're up against some some predisposition, we're up against some biology, he may usefully change the narrative. He doesn't have a narrative, right? He's, he doesn't appreciate the service. He doesn't appreciate what his contribution is. He needs to do a little work on what his contribution is, to take some distance. He, the filter, the granularity of his experience is to one. He needs to contract the filter. He really does need to intellectualize. You, I mean, we're a bunch of, many of us, speaking personally, over-intellectualization is no favorite indoor sport. It's been known. People are educated may tend to go there. So it's great. Keep doing it. There's nothing wrong with it as such. Nevertheless, so we constantly have to struggle against that. This is one example <coughs> where one may usefully do some work increasing the granularity, narrowing, contracting, constricting. So that's a breakdown in empathic receptivity. He's suffering too much. Strange as it may sound, he should suffer, but not too much. He should have a vicarious experience, so he's sensitive to, does this one hurt, or does this one hurt? Right? You write the deficit, on a good day, he gets it right. Which one, you know, and then you give up, oh my God, that's the one. And then he's very careful with that one. So he has a vicarious experience. Uh, and so, okay, so moving right along. So I pause, let's pause for breath. Questions about that? Comments? Not required, but... Okay, so we'll, move, we'll keep moving along, and, and we'll have just enough time. The next example is also in Thomas Mann. And remember, the uh, Gerda is playing passionate violin duos with her father. She moves away. She meets the lieutenant. He plays the violin. They, there's, Thomas has his home office in the back of the big house. And they're upstairs, Gerda and the lieutenant playing duos on the violin. It's so, you know, all of a sudden, the music stops. There's silence. The silence continues. The silence continues. The silence continues. It goes on like that for quite a while. Uh, here they are. Here's Gerda and the lieutenant. He's not in his uniform. 
and she's demonstrating playing Kitsikani on the violin. Anyway, they're upstairs having, <coughs> do, having their violin session, and there's a long silence. Thomas is going nuts. What's going on? He doesn't want to be a caricature of the jealous husband. These are sophisticated people. Thank you very much. He's not going to barge in and be a caricature of the, of the uh, jealous husband, whatever I said. It's the jealous husband that he did. And, um, and so he's wandering the corridor. He's walking back and forth, right? He doesn't know what to do. He's like sweating too, although there's his teeth are not being drilled. He's wandering back, and so he runs into Hannah who's expecting, you know, to be drilled on his mathematical tables or whatever he's being, his Latin declensions or verb forms. He, he's a, but, and they greet one another. You know, poor Hanno's like miserable. This guy, it, Hanno, so here, I think I mentioned this, right? The, Nord, the Nordic strapling types tease him and beat him up at school, at home, you know, his father's like the boot camp dad, he'll go well mad, fuck up son, you know. Uh, and anyway, so he's intimidated, but the boy is intimidated. Which brings us, so they run it, you know, there's still silence. Okay, so here's, the, here's an example, arguably, uh, but, but his father did not seem to be listening. He held Hanno's free hand and played with it absently, unconsciously fingering the slim fingers. And then Hanno heard something that had nothing to do with his lessons at all. His father's voice, in a tone he had never heard before, low, distressed, almost imploring. Ah, no, the lieutenant has been more than two hours with mama. End quote. Little Hanno opened wide his golden brown eyes at the sound. They looked as never before clear, large, and loving, straight into his father's face with its reddened eyelids under the light brows, its white puffy cheeks, and long, stiff mustaches. God knows how much he understood, but one thing they both felt. In the long second when their eyes met, all constraint, coldness, and misunderstanding melted away. Hanno might fail his father in all that demanded vitality, energy, aliveness, and strength. But where fear and suffering were in question, there Thomas Budenbrooks could count on the trust and devotion of his son. On that common ground, they met as one. And one. So, their eyes meet. Ah, no, Mama has been with the lieutenant more than two hours. Got no idea what this guy is talking about. I mean, he's eight years old, maybe nine, not very old. But he get. I mean, their eyes meet. He gets something. Right? And so this is. There's. There is a moment of receptivity here, inside the understanding. There's a possibility, and I hope this helps to motivate what empathic understanding is. What's the possibility? This is not a quiz. What's the empathic possibility? It's okay, you can shout it out. I mean, I have an answer. Yeah. And one possibility, consider the possibility, that the possibility is something like vulnerability. This is boot camp dad, hail fellow well met. Here, whatever Hanno understands from nothing about the symbolism of playing violin duos and the lieutenant and mama, you know, having a play date upstairs in the music room, right? I mean, this is like, you know, this is 1900. Right? Um, nevertheless, there's a vulnerability there. The possibility of dad, the father, being a mensch, being a human who's vulnerable. And, 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 and Ma, of course, is author, fear and suffering, you know, that's a lot of that in little Hanno's life. And so, uh, that in itself, I mean, that in itself is a powerful encounter. And ultimately, I mean, Hanno is, 
you know, his empathy are, is emerging, arguably. He's grown up. I mean, he's struggling with his own suffering and has different ways of expressing it. Thomas, I mean, is some, I mean, the, the breakdown. So what's the breakdown there? I mean, Thomas Budenbrooks continues to project the requirement that Hanno go into the family business. It's just not going to go well. We can't let go of that, and it's a good job. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, those are two good examples. We're not actually going to really have time uh, to do Cyrano de Bergerac and uh, the Glass Menagerie, because um, I want to give you a, time, a chance to ask whatever questions you may have. Maybe some of that will come up. This presentation is posted uh, on the web. You can also get my card, and I'll send it to you, you know, if you're curious about that. Um, questions, comments? Let's go straight to, to that. What do you all think? Well, thanks. And, uh, just something I kind of is very difficult. Something you haven't addressed is uh, don't we as individuals and as societies from time to time decide to limit our, responsible for, our responsibility for empathy to certain groups and put some groups outside them? Let's yes. say, as a nation, we decide to go to war. There's something out there called the enemy. And you don't want to feel, you don't want to be happy with the enemy. You know, the whole idea is to put them outside our, our sphere of empathy. I mean, thank you. I mean, can I, the question is please comment on that. I mean, may I repeat the question? Did you all hear it? I mean, we put some groups outside of, in effect, the circle of empathy. Usually we call them the enemy. And so, trade-off, I mean, you know, let me be the devil's advocate. Could there be value in top-down empathy with the enemy? We're trying to second-guess what they're going to do, because we can respond to it the better to defeat them. So I think there is a cognitive kind of empathy that is useful, regardless of the situation. Uh, on the other hand, in the full adult definition of empathy, which includes getting inside the other person's experience of things not going right, when there's a, there's a famous story, right, and it keeps happening in the news where there's an intruder into the home and the homeowner has a gun, you see where this is going, and he shoots the intruder, and the intruder, the intruder is his son, or his stepson, or a member of his family. <coughs> we define a level of caring, and we include some groups inside, if you will, the level of caring as if it would be okay to shoot him if it weren't his son. Wait a minute, right? I mean, it's just especially, you know, dramatic. I mean, uh, and um, so, so the, the, this is why, this gives me a chance to say something about the ontological definition in terms of being. Empathy is a way of being. It's being with another human being. When all the categories which I have plenty, I acknowledge that. When all the distinctions, when all the philosophical arguments, when all of the labels, when all of the, all of, are removed, the ontological empathy is being with another human being without anything added. And so, the community is that large. And it may even include some mammals, too. We seem to have some relatedness with with those. Uh, but even there, it seems to not include insects, spiders, and snakes. I'm not quite sure why. There may be something biological there. Uh, other questions, comments? So I'm, okay, sorry. So you mentioned Jacob Baron Cohen's work and talking about uh, outline. Yeah. With the idea of how empathy functions, is there any uh, translations in the literature with any any type of interventional psychotherapy, any kind of work to expand empathy to grow? You mentioned growing empathy. Yeah. Is there a way to grow empathy yeah. in some of our outlines? And the recommendation, great, thank you, because it's not, there's stuff we didn't get to. The way to grow empathy, outliers or even in the mass of, so to say, the modern 
mass of people. One approach to growing empathy is to remove obstacles to empathy. Remove denial, cynicism, fear, guilt. The list is long. Shame has got to be on the list. When we remove the resist, if you will, the resistance to empathy, when we remove the resistance to empathy, empathy naturally shows up. We are considered as possible that we are naturally in that. And we have to shut it down to get through the day, survive the day. Hey, I'm trying to survive the day on a given day. And especially in life in the corporate jungle, and that, you know, the corporate jungle is everywhere, so, right? So that's one approach. Now, there are other, that's like the psychotherapeutic, in a sense, the, the more dynamic. It's not that we can't also work from the inside out, work with clues, right? I mean, especially with outliers, it, there may actually be some, some thing biological, if I may use that term, where the individual is not picking up on certain fine-grained aspects of experience that I, or some more standard human being, would pick up on. Uh, because of some, I'm just going to say biological issue, you know, it's hormonal or neurological, the list is so long. Um, so th then you may want to need to work more top-down and from the outside in. But I, I think I have a Dilbert here where, uh, so I'll just lower this is so bad. Uh, but there's a close relationship between empathy and humor. <coughs> And we're not going to do the exercise, but here is kind of the exercise. So, uh, you know, the pointy head boss says, now all teams will be formed on the basis of Myers-Briggs personality types. If you do not have a personality type, one will be, if you do not have a personality, one will be assigned to you by the human resources department. Then the devil says to the, the other guy, we need a quiet, dumb guy to pair with an extroverted thinker. Da -da. This is a very serious group, I must say. Okay. Uh, and so, so here's the point. Categories. This is deeply cynical. It's funny. It's funny. I mean, and it is not recommended that you take this in one case as a coach. Because of the cynicism gets in the way of the empathy. I mean, it's not to say that some of this is not a blog in the land. It is. It's good news, bad news, right? But in this, it demonstrates that denial, cynicism, fear, you know, People working here are going to be fearful. I'm going to get labeled and devalued. And that's actually the exercise we have to do. We distinguish that devalue. It's not going to go away. But we can shrink it and distinguish it and then relate as human beings. Thank you for that. I think it enables me to and, and So listen, we are at the top of the hour, possibly a few minutes over. I'm going to be around. I mean, I'm scheduled till you know, whatever it is, one noon, 20 minutes after. I'm happy to engage one on one with Brother Kai. I wish to express my appreciation for your gracious listening. I got a lot of empathy. Mm -hmm. I hope, and likewise, I hope you all did too. Uh, feel free to get my card. I'd be happy to follow up as a conversation. I would